welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Good day, young Martin. How are you doing? I'm good, and you? I'm fine. Um, we'd like to off start off before we begin with our discussion, just to give some clarity on the answering of questions. Yes. And we just want to make it clear to the viewers, we really appreciate all questions and all comments, but it's humanly impossible to get through to and answer all the questions. It's absolutely <laughs> impossible. It will, I think if you have to answer the questions you get in one day, it can keep you quite busy for a year. It's not possible. So we just want to say that we try our best to answer as many as possible. And that's why we also do uh, questions and answer WhatsApp profs and also take a look at the links we provide. And there's also a questions and answer database on our website that's also posted and everything. So just to get some clarity for people on that. But if we can, we do take yes. note. Yes. Yeah. So I'll open for a word, with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together again. Thank you, Lord, that we can have these discussions in the times that we live in. We ask again that you bless us with this discussion and also enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, Martin, today we're talking about the Roman Church. And uh, it's not something that uh, you know we cherish, no. but it's something that is necessary. And in the light of events currently, I mean, we've spoken about it so much, mm. and people say, oh, there they go again. But people don't get it. No. They just don't get it. It's a very serious issue. And like you said, people probably, it doesn't seem that they get what is this whole Roman Catholicism church about. about. Yes. And what you, this whole uh, discussion actually came about very quickly. And it was again about speeches that we've come across that Biden and Trump made. Yes, we need to look at this. And uh, we'll start off with the video and then we'll see where it takes us and why we have to go in this direction. Uh, it's not a popular message that we have. And it is an ancient message, and it is necessary that people don't forget. Mm. Yes. So let's have a look at some of the speeches that have been made recently at prayer breakfasts and at special occasions, especially before the elections. So these are brand new, mm -hmm. and they are very current. So let us look at the issue. I know for me, my Catholic faith has helped me through the darkness as I've had to bury pieces of my soul deep in the earth and eventually found purpose to live a life worthy of those I lost. And throughout my life in public service, I've been guided by the tenets of Catholic social doctrine that cuts across all confessional faiths. What you do to the least among us, you do unto me. We have an obligation to one another. We cannot serve ourselves at the expense of others. We have a responsibility to future generations. And that's the charge before us today. And that sense of hope and possibility reminds me of the first time I met Pope Francis in 2013, when I had the privilege of attending his inauguration at the Vatican. When I greeted him, he said, Mr. Vice President, you're always welcome here. He was really sending a message to the world to put out a welcome sign on the front door of our church. Two years later, President Obama and I welcomed him at the White House. At that same moment, we shared a sense of hope and possibility together. And for me, it came in a very personal moment, a very tough time in the life of my family. Our son, Bo, had just died a few months earlier. But Pope Francis took the time to meet with my entire family to help us see the light through the darkness. I live in an amazing country. We all live in an amazing country. 
where an Irish Catholic kid like me from Scranton, Pennsylvania, would one day befriend the Jesuit Pope. But that's who we are as a country, where anything is possible when we care for one another, when we look out for one another, when we keep the faith. May God bless you all, and may God bless America, and may God protect our troops. Well, that was the Biden speech. This is normally a very public event, and mm. normally the cardinal is present, but this year it had to be a Zoom event. It's fascinating to me that the Biden camp is just as religiously orientated mm. as the other camp. You know, we're always inclined to think that uh, the Trump campaign and the Trump camp is uh, closer to the King of the North. But in many respects, the Biden camp is closer than the Trump camp. Yeah. Because he mentioned the Catholic social doctrine. Exactly. And the Democratic Party has a manifesto and a vision which is much closer to the Catholic social doctrine than is the Trump camp. Yes. So uh, the King of the North sits in both. And it doesn't really matter who wins. Yeah. Uh, the ascendancy of the King of the North philosophy can just as well be in both parties. So it doesn't matter at all no. who wins the election. The, the issue of prophecy will be fulfilled. It's quite um, important to notice that because it doesn't matter which one will win, the uh, dictates of Rome will be enforced. Absolutely. And he's on the same page. Yes. Biden is more on the page in terms of social doctrine. I just read the Pope, Pope's latest uh, encyclical on brotherly fraternity. And I must say that uh, I was surprised. It's about 90 pages long. And I went through it with a tooth comb and highlighted many places. Basically, it's a rewrite of Rerum Novarum on Catholic social, social doctrine. And if you read it carefully, it sounds so, so sweet and flowery and loving and uh, accommodating and kind. But it is basically aligned against every tenet of the Bible. And it is literally against the commandments of God. But people won't notice it because the language is so carefully chosen. It's like the joint document on, on the Declaration, declaration of uh, Justification by Faith. Yeah, we'll look we'll, at that. We'll look at that. Yeah. This is the same type of language. It just the same in. type. They, kn the, they know how to disguise. And what was interesting for me, I don't know if it's, maybe I'm, seeing something too much in it, in it, but that he specifically said it's um, an honor to have a Jesuit pope as a, f as a friend. As why a would friend. he want to Why would he bring want to up, say that? Yeah, bring yes. out that it's a Jesuit pope. Yes. Well, let's look at the next ones. It is a profound honor to address the 75th annual Al Smith Dinner. For generations, this wonderful event has been a revered institution in New York and New York life. I fondly remember attending with my father a long time ago. I was a young man, but never forgot it. This organization's incredible tradition of Catholic charity exemplifies the very best, not only of this city, but of this country. I want to thank Cardinal Dolan, a very special man, for his extraordinary stewardship of the Archdiocese and for his deep dedication to God and to our nation. I also want to thank him for all of the help he's given me and so many things and so many different ways. Thank you very much, Cardinal. We very much appreciate it. And of course, the Catholic community and the men and women of the New York Archdiocese answered the call and frankly, answered it like nobody else could. In Catholic schools, hospitals, shelters, soup kitchens, and food pantries, you served with the supreme devotion to your fellow citizens. You showed the world the essence of the Catholic faith. I've known about it for a long time. I lived right next to a magnificent Catholic church. As Jesus Christ said in the gospel, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As president, I want to thank the Catholic community for the magnificent generosity you showed in America's hour of need. From the very beginning of our republic, Catholics have uplifted and enriched our nation beyond measure. Catholics like Charles Carroll helped secure American independence. Women like St. Elizabeth Ann Seton founded a movement that created thousands of schools and lifted children out of poverty. And the great Al Smith, the original happy warrior, that's what he was. He was a happy warrior. I know it well. I consider myself to be a happy warrior, but it's not so easy at these times. But he was a happy warrior of American politics. He spent his life fighting for hardworking Americans and battling the anti-Catholic prejudice that you see even today coming out of the Democrat Party. Today, this amazing group continues that proud tradition of faithful service. Your work reminds us of an essential truth. In this country, civil society, and especially our religious institutions, are an essential foundation of American freedom. Our nation is strong because of Catholics and, frankly, people of all faiths. That is why, as president, one of my top priorities is to defend religious liberty and the cherished role of faith and faith-based organizations in our national life. To protect your God-given rights, I was recently honored to nominate one of our most brilliant legal minds, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, to the United States Supreme Court. And that was an honor indeed. She is a proud graduate of the University of Notre Dame Law School, where her professor, one of the most respected anywhere in the country, said she was the single greatest student he has ever had in his class. We will not stand for any attacks against Judge Barrett's faith. Anti-Catholic bigotry has absolutely no place in the United States of America. It predominates in the Democrat Party, and we must do something immediately about it, like a Republican win. And let's make it a really big one. To support the noble mission of Catholic schools, my administration is working to advance school choice. It was my great honor to help the Catholic Church with its schools. They needed hundreds of millions of dollars nationwide. And I got it for him. Nobody else. I got it for him. I hope you remember that on November 3rd, but I got it for him. And it was an honor to do it. I did it at the request of Cardinal Dolan and others of your leaders. They really needed it. We took care of that situation. Very important. We are once again standing with Catholic charities and health care providers, such as the Little Sisters of the Poor. We've been with them all the way in this long fight. We are fighting for Catholic adoption agencies and fighting hard. And we are defending the sacred right to life. Remember that when you vote. That's so important and so important to the Supreme Court. Every child, born and unborn, is made in the holy image of God. Few institutions in history have done more for New York, more for America, or more for people of the world than the Catholic Church. From the parishes of this city came the soldiers who fought to end slavery the workers who raised up the towering skyline of Manhattan, the chaplains who landed on the beaches of Guadalcanal, the nuns who marched for civil rights, and the police officers and firefighters who we love so much who ran into the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Now more than ever, our nation needs a renewal of the values that this organization promotes and that the Catholic faithful live out each and every day in peace we love the Catholic people. We love the Catholic religion. And above all, we respect it greatly. As president, I will always support you in your effort to serve our fellow citizens and to lift up all humanity. I will protect the Catholic Church, and I will defend the rights of religious believers of every race, religion, color, and creed. Thank you once again to the Al Smith Memorial Foundation. God bless you. God bless New York. And God bless America. That was a mouthful. Sure. That was really quite something. You can watch that a few times to get a grip of what he actually is saying. Yes. That was very, very powerful. And he's addressing, of course, Cardinal Dolan as well, mm -hmm. who is the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States. Mm -hmm. Not worldwide, but in the United States. And he's also, uh, well, the Catholic representative for the armed forces. So this is really church and state uh, 
at the highest level. Yes. And he made it quite clear that anti-Catholic mm -hmm. sentiment has to end and that uh, Rome has played such a pivotal role in all of these issues and taking care of the poor mm -hmm. and the soup kitchens and all of those things, many of them are, of course, absolutely true. Mm -hmm. So I want to make it quite clear. Nobody here in this forum is against Catholics. No, not the persons. No, the people are doing the best they can living according to the light that they have. Absolutely. So this is not about Catholics. This is about Catholicism. Mm. And this is where the great danger lies. Mm. And uh, we want to listen to another speech that he held, a very similar speech, yep. but uh, just to get the full picture, he says a few things that are slightly different. Mm -hmm. This was at the prayer breakfast yes. where... William Barr. William Barr. And his speech, and he also got the honorary award. Yes, and we looked at that in, the, in our last WhatsApp. So let's just look at what Donald Trump said at that particular one. It is my great honor to address the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. I want to thank my good friend, Leonard Leo, and the board members of this wonderful breakfast, as well as, of course, the Knights of Columbus. And congratulations to Attorney General Bill Barr, special man, on receiving the annual award. I grew up next to a Catholic church in Queens, New York, and I saw how much incredible work the Catholic Church did for our community. These are amazing people. These are great, great people. Catholic schools give many underserved children the chance to reach their God-given potential. Catholics of all backgrounds share the love of Christ with the most vulnerable as they care for the elderly, the homeless, and neighbors in need. Our nation is strong because of Catholics and all people of faith. We believe in the joy of family, the blessing of freedom, and the dignity of work and the eternal truth that every child, born and unborn, is made in the holy image of God. I will always protect the vital role of religion and prayer in American society, and I will always defend the sacred right to life. Today, I am announcing that I will be signing the Born Alive Executive Order to ensure that all precious babies born alive, no matter their circumstances, receive the medical care that they deserve. This is our sacrosanct moral duty. We are also increasing federal funding for the neonatal research to ensure that every child has the very best chance to thrive and to grow. Melania and I recently visited the shrine of St. John Paul II, a man who had such a profound impact on our country and the world. It was an incredible visit. On his first visit to the United States, he concluded his visit to a Catholic parish in Harlem with these words, let the good news of Christ radiate from your hearts and the peace that He alone gives remain forever in your souls. We are very grateful for the millions of Catholics across America who live by these beautiful words and bring hope and joy and light and grace to the world. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. And please, take good care of Bill Barr. He's very important to all of us. Right, so we now have a picture of the view that the world basically has of Catholics and that the president espouses in the United States of America. And yes, they do have humanitarian works and they do have soup kitchens, and they do many good works. But that is not the issue. The issue lies much deeper. And the people in the world need to know. Now, I myself was raised Catholic. And uh, going through an atheistic phase, I actually became very Catholic again, for a short while, until I discovered some things which were very, very disturbing. Not in what they do, but in what they believe and in their history as 
to how they deal with people that do not believe as they believe. Yes. Uh, can I just say, that is what's important to me to take out of these, especially Trump's speeches. Well, Biden as well. And we, like you said, we agree. There's lots of these wonderful people, and what they maybe do is wonderful. But he said, we love the Catholic religion. Yes. And that is what we want to look at. So why do people say that if you speak against Catholicism these days, you are a bigot. So let us just continue and see what the real issue is. Now, I don't want to quote from an Adventist source f from the beginning, mm -hmm. so let's go to the Church of England. And in the late 1800s, what did they believe and why did they believe it? This is the book Romanism and the Reformation by H. Grattan Guinness. He was a priest in the Church of England and he wrote in the foreword, The Reformation of the 16th century which gave birth to Protestantism was based on Scripture. It gave back the world the Bible. It taught the Scriptures. It exposed the errors and corruptions of Rome by the use of the sword of the Spirit. It applied the prophecies and accepted their practical guidance. Such reformation work requires to be done afresh. We have suffered prophetic anti-papal truth to be too much forgotten. This generation is dangerously latitudinarian. That's a beautiful word, isn't it? You must explain that a bit. Well, you have longitude and you have yeah. latitude. They're asleep. They're asleep. They're asleep. Indifferent to truth and error on points on which Scripture is tremendously decided and absolutely clear. The very worst thing that can happen to an individual is to be deceived. Yes. Deception is worse than blatant confrontation. Although this deception led in many cases to open confrontation as mm -hmm. well. Let me just go back to what Martin Luther said. Now, this is an old book and I happen to have an old copy. You get much m more modern copies, not one that's falling apart like this one. It's a very old book, but uh, hmm, it smells like <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Un untouched, um, unmolested. Uh, it's yes, it's definitely unmolested. You know the very writings of this book. This is a series of lectures that he gave on the Roman question, and uh, uh, this book is falling apart. It's a del magnificent book. Everybody should read Romanism and the Reformation. Is he writes uh, in the foreword here, lecture one, the Daniel pre foreview of Romanism. Fifty years ago, the eminent statesman Sir Robert Peel said, with remarkable clear foresight, the day is not far distant and it may be very near when we shall have to fight the battle of the Reformation over again. And he's right. And 100%. Yes. We have to know why we believe what we believe. We have to be firm. The day has come. Mm -hmm. This was written in the late 1800s. Yep. And we can see from the speeches that we just heard that the world has forgotten. And the entire Protestant world has been duped into following a false prophetic teaching. Not the teaching that they used to have at all. So when we, when we read through a book like this, it says here on page 5, we feel constrained to renew the grand old protest to which the world owes its modern acquisition of liberty, knowledge, peace, and prosperity. Mm. Yes, we need, we feel constrained 
to renew the grand old protest to which the world owes its modern acquisitions of liberty, knowledge, peace, and prosperity. There is no peace in the world today, and there is a decline in prosperity. It says here, it is a fact that though the canon of scripture was closed ages before Romanism began to exist and 15 centuries before the Reformation, yet it presents the divine judgment as to both. The Bible records the past in its histories and the future in its prophecies, which are simply history written beforehand. Very well put. These, these writers are unbelievable. The Reformation, this is on page 9, the Reformation was a return to primitive or non-apostate Christianity. That is very nicely put. Accomplished between three and four centuries ago, well, now it's five already, mm. in this country, in Germany, and some other countries in Europe. One feature of this great movement was the abandonment of the use of Latin in public worship, the translation of the scriptures into the living language so that all nations might read the word of God in their own tongue and understand for themselves its sacred messages. The names of Luther, Zwingli, Erasmus, Tyndall, Knox, Calvin, Latimer, Ridley, Cranmer, Hooper, and others are associated with this Reformation. And then he goes into the book of Daniel and he talks about the prophecies in the book of Daniel. And he talks about the writings of Paul and he says the Apostle Paul, for view, on the other hand, gives the ecclesiastical character and relationship of this power, referring to the prophecies regarding Daniel and Revelation. Now, let me just turn to the next chapter where he starts talking about... Let me just find it. I have to page carefully in this book because it's falling apart. It's a beautiful book. Here's lecture two. And he gives a whole expose of Daniel chapter 7. So he puts the whole of Daniel chapter 7 in the chapter. And then he says on page 37, in these verses you have the entire story of the papacy. And what is more, you have its future as well as its past. The judgment of God as to its moral character and deserve. If you had learned the ABC of the language of the hieroglyphs, you would at once recognize that such creatures as are figures of godless empires. So he describes the empires yeah. as listed in Daniel chapter 7. And he says that these are symbols of godless empires. He also says that it's important with th that we should clearly grasp one great historical fact. That is, the rule of Rome has never, since its first commence, ceased to exist. Mm. Save once for a very brief period during the Gothic Inquisition. Rome, we repeat, he says, has never ceased. It was a secular pagan power for five or six centuries. It has been an ecclesiastical and apostate Christian power ever since. Mm. Apostate Christian power. Apostate Christian power. And then he describes the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. We could go there, I have the Bible, but we don't want to give a Bible study. I just want to just say what the Reformers' view was on this particular issue. And he talks about the little horn power and he says, the power symbolized by the proud, intelligent, blasphemous, head-like little horn of the Roman beast. To this he devotes, on the contrary, the great part of the prophecy. And I must ask you carefully to note the various points that prove that this 
horn to be the marvelous prophetic symbol or hieroglyph of the Roman papacy. Fitting it as one of Chubb's keys fits the lock for which it is made perfectly and in every part while it refuses absolutely to adapt itself to any other. Isn't that undeniable. well Undeniable. 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 In fact, some people have actually worked out the statistics and said that it is absolutely impossible. I mean, the chances are one to the number of atoms in the entire universe that one organization could fulfill all of these prophecies if it weren't a divinely inspired mm -hmm. prophetic scenario. And then he, he lists them. And he lists a few of them and he says, it says where it would arise in the body of the fourth empire. In other words, in the heart of the Roman mm -hmm. power, in the, amongst the powers of Europe. At the period of its origin, soon after the division of the Roman territory into ten kingdoms. This is Church of England. Yeah. This is not Adventism. It's nature different from the other kingdoms, though in some respects like them. It, it was a horn, that is a political entity. But with eyes and a mouth. It would be a kingdom like the rest, a monarchy, but its king would be overseers or bishops and prophets. These people had insight. Mm. The moral character, boastful, blasphemous, great words spoken against the Most High. It's lawlessness. It would claim authority over times and laws. It would change God's laws. It would change God's times. It's opposition to the saints. It would be a persecuting power. It's duration, time, times, and half a time. And here it says, in this book, I'm going to show it to you. 1,260 years. These people had prophetic insight, yeah. and the world has forgotten this. They, they're looking for an Antichrist Exa to come just in the future. just wanted to say that. And here is a system that ruled for all those years, mm -hmm. whose mortal wound would be healed, and the kings of the world, and we just listened to them. Yeah, th there they are. There they are, will give their power unto the beast. What did Biden say? Social doctrine is being the social doctrine of the Roman Catholic yeah. Church is the one that they want implemented. It's been the in his life that is what it's And for five hundred years the Reformation saw to it that Catholic social doctrine would not be the rule of the land. Mm -hmm. now, I don't want to be mean. But look at the Protestant countries and look at the Catholic countries. Which ones were the prosperous ones? Yeah. The Protestant, the Protestant ones. ones. And why are they so rapidly in decline? Because we're heading back to the same old system. Yep. And I wish the kings of the world would study history. I wish they would understand what mm -hmm. the Reformation is about. This is not about, are you a nice guy? This is about what you believe. Yes, that's and what... Yeah, there are three central pillars mm. that every Christian denomination that believed in the Bible and the Bible and the Bible alone were absolutely firm on. The one is the supremacy of Christ. That nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved except the name Christ Jesus. That's, that's an immovable pillar. The second one is that the Bible is the rule of faith. Yes. The Bible and the Bible alone is the rule of faith. If you have any extraneous source, mm -hmm. like the Seventh-day Adventists believe that the writings of Ellen G. White are in harmony with this word. Yeah. Her writings must be tested by this word. Exactly. Not this word tested by her writings. No. So the rule of faith remains the Bible and the Bible alone. 
And ever since the inception of Christianity, there were people that stood for the law and kept the Sabbath. Yeah. The early Christian church mm -hmm. kept the Sabbath. And all of these things have been changed by the Roman power. Mm -hmm. And this is where the error lies. And we have to look at these historic events. So we're not going to go through the book, but just to show people that this is what Protestantism believed. Mm -hmm. And you can see this is an old book. It's falling apart. But to read what these people believed is amazing. And people have forgotten it. And it's important also that, like you have mentioned before, but we are not trying to degrade people. No. You get very nice atheists as well. Oh, you get so wonderful people that are atheists. Most of my colleagues were atheists, and some of them were, were wonderful people to be with. So it's not about the people. No. It's about the religion. It's because about this is believe. what will be playing the, the role. And, and this is what we have to talk yes. about. This is what we have to talk about. So let us continue and see what the real problem is and why the world needs to be reminded over and over again because we are going to repeat history and it's not going to be a beautiful sight. No. What was the central pillar of the Reformation? Martin Luther, he was speaking about justification by faith alone. He said, of this article, nothing can be yielded or surrendered, nor can anything be granted or permitted contrary to the same. This is the first and chief article of faith of Protestantism. He said, if the article of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost at the same time. This doctrine, justification, is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. In other words, this is a religious war. Mm. This is a war about salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes. And this is what people do not understand. Mm. If I accept the authority of a power that undermines the authority of Jesus Christ, then I'm serving an anti-Christ power. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how many times that specific power elevates or is saying that they elevate Christ. Yes, they can mention the name of Christ all the um, time. They the can time. preach in the name of Christ, but if they do not do what he says, then they are contrary to the scriptures. So Rome was the one who cursed this doctrine of justification by faith alone. Mm. Anyone who says that sinners are justified by faith alone so as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order unto obtaining the grace of justification, let him be an anathema. That's Canon 9 and Canon 14. Anyone who says that sinners are justified by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins without the charity which is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, without infused grace, let him be an anathema. So Rome is literally saying that we become righteous instead of having an imputed righteousness, mm. an alien righteousness, one that is outside of ourselves. We're just looking at the core doctrine here. Of course, all the other doctrines go along with that. We can speak about those yeah. as well. So when we come to the joint document on justification, which today, of course, is the compromise. Yes, because you just read 
the Council of Trent. Yes. But then there's a lot of people that say, yeah, but that Vatican II Council. Vatican II did not rescind a single doctrine proclaimed at the Council of Trent and could not do so mm -hmm. because they were spoken ex cathedra, infallibly. Yes. If they had to rescind it, they would destroy the doctrine of the infallibility of the Roman Catholic Church. So the doctrines as expounded in the Council of Trent stand. stand. Just want to make that clear. And uh, we have many bishops saying that. Bishop Schneider was mm -hmm. one who said it quite openly. It doesn't matter what the papacy says. As long as it doesn't say it ex cathedra, it can go in any direction. What matters is what was said ex cathedra from the bishop's chair. So here is uh, the wording of the document of the joint declaration between Protestantism and Catholics, mm -hmm. which was now to end the great rift between them. And it states the following, Together we confess, by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us unto good works. Now this sounds wonderful, wonderful. but it is written by a pen which has the sting of death in it. Because this is Catholic doctrine disguised as Protestant God doctrine. They're very clever with their words. So we've discussed it before. We don't want to go into great detail, but uh, we confess that by grace alone. No. Yes, it's true that we are saved by grace alone. Mm. But the issue is the grace can only be applied after faith. Yes. Faith. How do are we saved? By faith in Christ's atoning blood, yes, right? Yes, because otherwise everybody can be saved yes. because of the grace. Uh, can I give you grace if no. you were mean to me? Sure I can. I, oh can, yeah. be, I can be gracious to you, right? Mm -hmm. I can be gracious. Can I save you? No. No. Uh, could you be saved by faith in me? No. No. It would be a pretty useless venture, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so it shouldn't read by grace alone. It should read by faith alone, Correct. because without faith it is impossible to please him. Yeah. By faith alone, in faith, they say by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving work. work. No, in Christ's atonement, yes. by his blood, because they believe, of course, that you are saved by works. Mm. And Christ's good works are in this pot called the treasury of merit, but so are the good works of Mary and the saints. Mm. So they are just on a par. Yeah. And uh, Pope Francis, of course, loves to quote uh, Saint Francis. Mm -hmm. And Saint Francis is the one that he is following, and he is the hero of the story. It's a total pantheistic deity that yes. they are serving. And if you read his latest document, we'll go through it in, in a future yes, WhatsApp. We'll look at some of the yeah. issues. But uh, this pantheistic deity uh, that was so revered by St. Francis yeah. is the hero of the system of Pope Francis. And we've also but where's Jesus? Yeah. Remember we looked at that document also the, uh, for the uh, Jubilee for the Earth? Same that thing? Was a, and that was a Protestant document. Yes. And it was the same language, the same pantheistic language. language. Absolutely. So this is a, a misquoting of the doctrine of justification. If it had read, by faith alone, in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then it would have been fine. But then it continues, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our heart while equipping and calling us unto good works. Mm. So that, of course, is not justification. That's sanctification. So this is a mixture 
of sanctification and justification with a misrepresentation of justification. And Protestants think it's wonderful. Yeah, they signed. They signed. So this is a very wily foe. We have to be very careful how we go about it. Zenit News reports in its article on Pope Benedict's speech on papal primacy, titled The World Seen from Rome, Benedict XVI highlights first century papal primacy. Because this is the other issue. The Reformation said Christ is the head of the church. Mm. The Sc Church of Scotland said we have no king but Jesus, right? Yes when they rejected the British rule and the British monarch. Same here. It's a bit contradictory to what the Jews said at Ju uh, Jesus' cru crucifixion. They, they said we have no king, no but, king but Caesar. Caesar. Yeah, you're right. So what did he have to say there? Now, this is bringing it just into modern times because the question is always, has Rome changed? Mm-hmm. Rome cannot change. Its doctrine doesn't allow it to be changed. It cannot rescind an ex cathedra statement without rescinding papal infallibility. Can't do it. Mm. This is a very um, serious matter because most denominations and people say Rome has changed. Yes, that's right. There are a lot of people even in our own ranks that say that Rome has changed. It has not changed. And here are some statements, as we will see. This is now Pope Benedict. I mean, he's still alive, right? Correct. Technically speaking, he's still, still a pope. pope. Yes. Already in the first century, popes exercised their primacy over the other churches, Benedict the Sixteenth said. The Holy Father explained this on Wednesday at the general audience which he dedicated to Pope St. Clement of Rome, the third successor of Peter. St. Clement's letter clarifies the distinction between hier hierarchy and laity. You see, the Roman Catholic Church raised the hierarchy of the church above the laity. Yeah. The Bible makes no such distinction. No. In the modern translations, they have to violate the grammar yeah. in order to make that distinction when there is no distinction. Yeah. We've talked about We've talked that about before. That. So we must be very careful. So firstly, they believe in this hierarchy. They have elevated themselves. And he said, the clear distinction between the lay people and the hierarchy does not mean in any way a contraposition but only the organic connection of a body, of an organism with different functions. They always speak in such flowery language. But what he's basically saying, I'm your boss. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, the church is not a place for confusion and anarchy. We need a boss where someone can do whatever he wants at any time, each one in this organism with an articulated structure practices his ministry according to the vocation received. As pertains to the heads of the communities, Clement specifies clearly the doctrine of apostolic succession. Mm. In other words, that the authority came down the line yeah which they believed was given to Peter. Yes. But Paul rebuked Peter. And James Yes, at, was at the Council of Paul uh, rebuked James. Jerusalem. Absolutely. So they believe in this power coming down the line. And then he added, the laws that regulate this derive from God himself in an ultimate analysis. I am the boss. God said so, I rule by divine right. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. The Father sent Jesus Christ, who in turn sent the apostles. These then sent out the first heads of the communities and established that they would be followed by worthy men. Well, we see in history how worthy some of these men were in the system. The church is above all a gift of God and not a creature of ours, the Pope 
contended. And therefore, this sacramental structure, this is very important language, not only guarantees the common order, but also the precedence of the gift of God that we all need. Now that is astounding. He claims that the fact that he is the head of the church is a sacramental structure. Now in Catholic thinking, a sacrament is something that leads to salvation. salvation. So in other words, what he is saying is that the recognition of the papacy is absolutely necessary for salvation. That's what he's saying. And this is the modern pope who's still alive today, mm -hmm. who says that it's absolutely necessary in very, very disguised language mm -hmm. to be subject to the Roman pontiff. The acceptance of papal primacy is thus, according to the present Pope, a sacramental structure. This is me writing now. Mm -hmm. Which in Catholic thinking makes it a salvation issue. This is not a 19th century obscure quote, but demonstrates clearly that Rome has not changed. Absolutely. Accepting Jesus is a salvation issue, not accepting an earthly impostor who takes upon themselves the prerogatives of Christ. Benedict also elevates the clergy and assigns it a mediatorial role, just as the medieval church did. This comes from the Vatican webpage. And we just want to make sure that people know that this is not an obscure source, yeah. right? <laughs> so this is a very serious issue. It has to do with salvation. Do I have to accept the primacy of the Pope in order to be saved? Not according to the Bible. Did not Jesus use say. an intermediary while he was on earth to convey forgiveness of sins to anyone that he came into contact with? No. No, not at all. So if he didn't do it then, why should he do it now? This is the address of His Holiness Benedict to the members of the Episcopal Conference of Portugal on their ad limina visit. He says, It gives a great joy for me to receive you today in the house of Peter, who by the grace of God are solid pillars of that bridge which you are called to be and to create between humanity and its supreme destiny, the most holy trinity. Have you, have you thought about a statement like that? This is Benedict speaking. He's saying that the clergy mm -hmm. is the bridge to heaven. In other words, you can't get there without, without the, clergy. the clergy. So Christ is Aside. I just Clergy want to there. remind President Donald Trump, who claims to be a Protestant, that if this is the claim of the papacy, to stand on that bridge is a very, very, very dangerous thing to do. If I had to rely on the clergy to bring me to the promised land, I would be in serious, serious trouble the only source that I can rely on for correct information is this one. Yeah. The Bible. And the Bible alone. And if I read a book like this by Gratan Guinness, mm -hmm. this ancient book, if it's not in harmony with that. this book, then I have to lay this one aside and this one is my authority. The same for the writings of Ellen G. White or anybody else. Exactly. That is the falter. This is the filter, the ultimate filter. But he continues. He says he is the bridge. And he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then he takes this text and he says, a concrete sign of this incarnation is the pouring out of Christ's life, which flows forth from me, Benedict speaking, into the lives of others. This is because I cannot possess Christ just for myself. I can belong to him only in union with all those who have become or will become his own. We become one body completely joined in a single existence through whom? Through him. Yeah. 
not Christ. Through him and through the clergy. clergy. So this structure is the means to salvation, and that is not biblical. There is no other name mm -hmm. under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved. And this is the danger. Okay, let's just make sure. Well, here is Malachi Martin's book, and uh, it is Rich Church, Poor Church. Now, he was a Jesuit priest, mm -hmm. So let's see what he has to say. He maintains that the pontiff is the sole living representative of God amongst men, is endowed with absolute authority to teach God's salvation as revealed through his son Jesus Christ, who was and is God himself made man. Catholic teachings holds that any Roman Catholic, any non-Catholic Christian, or any non-Christian of whatever other religion who receives God's salvation, receives it through the spiritual office of that one man in Rome and the merits of his church of believers. That's pretty clear. Yes. So even if people would like to say that I misrepresented what Benedict says. Mm. I did not. Because here is the absolute statement by a Jesuit that this is exactly yes. what he meant. Every single doctrine that is held by Roman mm. Catholicism and that has been incorporated into Protestantism or not expunged out of Protestantism is a, is a doctrine against the Bible. You can, you can take any doctrine. Take the doctrine of baptism. Mm. Baptism is for believers. If you believe with your whole heart, yes. then you may. By the way, that verse has also been removed in modern translation, mm -hmm. which is exceedingly vexing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the issue is this. Baptism was to keep the world out of the church. By introducing infant baptism, which Rome did, it brought the world into, into the, the church, church and made it subject to the church. If you take any one of those doctrines, if you take the mass, any one of them, we'll look at some of them, we have, don't have to go into all of them, but they're all contrary to the word of God, yes. which should really tell you something. And, and we'll also, I'll put the link again for the WhatsApp profs that you did, on the doctrine of the serpent. Yes. Which clearly shows their teachings. Now, when the kings of the world give their power unto the beast, which the Bible says they will do, mm. then what are they doing? They are placing yes. their authority under the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Yes. That's very clear. And who have you sidelined then? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jesus Christ is someone who must be accepted by faith, by a personal choice, then you cannot force that conscience. Mm. So I'm not going against any other religion. I'm not trying to force any other religion to believe like I believe or like you believe. But what I'm saying, that if a Bible study reveals something to you and you do not act upon it, then it be for you, sin. Then it be for you, sin. They would change times and laws. They would change the commandments of God. Did Rome change the commandments of God? Yes. Absolutely. That shocked me. I was a Roman Catholic. And I asked the Roman Catholic priest to come to my house and say, excuse me, please explain to me why Rome changed the commandments of God. His answer to me was, I'm not into scripture, <laughs> which made me almost fall off my chair. And I said, but you're a priest. He says, I'm not into scripture. We have specialists that deal with scripture, obviously distorting it, right? Yeah. Well, yes. obviously, if he's a priest and he's not into scripture, what about the normal member of the church? Absolutely. That must be terrible. Then. Yes, I grew up with a catechism in my hand, mm. not with a Bible. I remember you had a story that you were looking for a Bible at one stage because there wasn't one in the house. No, there wasn't one in the house. Mm. Correct. But this is, this is Catholic teaching. Mm. 
And this is contrary to the word of God. Maguire's catechism puts it this way, bishops and priests of the church are called other Christs. They alone have the power to represent or to take the place of Christ in preaching his gospel and in offering his sacrifice for the glory of God and the salvation of men. Now, we read Benedict's statement mm -hmm. and it's published on the Vatican webpage, which I said was not an obscure source. It's very current mm. in terms of history. Yes. Has Rome changed? No. No. Through his ordination, a priest is supposed to receive a special supernatural powers, particularly to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ in the holy sacrifice of the Mass and to forgive sins in the sacrament of penance. Whose prerogative is it to forgive sins? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Don't they take the prerogative of Christ upon themselves here? Yep. Didn't even the Jews say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Exactly. And to say that you change the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ, then the created being becomes the creator mm -hmm. of the creator. Of the creator. Who's higher then? The creator. <laughs> <laughs> Middle being now. Absolutely. In 1988, the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland's clerk to the Synod, Reverend Donald MacLean's comment in his letter to the Times regarding the ecumenical movement, which now got rid of all of these differences, because even Pope Francis says, set doctrine aside. Yeah. And we gave two WhatsApps on the doctrine of the serpent. Yeah, yeah. So this is a very important issue. He said, the ecumenical movement which you praise is the greatest disaster to affect the Christian church this century. Just take note who this is. This is the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland clerk to the Synod, the Reverend Donald MacLean, and he said, it's the greatest disaster. It has reduced the professing churches of this country to a collection of bloodless, spineless, and boneless organizations which can hardly raise a whimper on the side of Christ and his truth. Small wonder that evil progresses as it does and spiritual darkness becomes more intense as the years go by. You appear to regard a body of professing Christians of sober conduct and deep spirituality of mind as fanatical and bigoted. Doesn't Pope Francis say the same? Yep. Doesn't he talk about Christian fundamentalists who believe the Bible absolutely? Absolutely. Then you qualify. Then you are a fundamentalist. And a terrorist. Yep. If this be so, then the eminent men of God, such as John Knox in Scotland, John Calvin and Martin Luther on the continent, and Archbishop Cranmer in England, were bigots in their contest with the errors of popery. We are glad to be in such company. The issue is one of faith and doctrine. This, this person writes about 100 years after the, that book, and it's after and he, this one. He has the same sentiment. He believes the same thing. We have allowed ourselves to be duped into no longer recognizing the wily foe. Mm. By the way, didn't presidents of the United States like Abraham Lincoln warn against this power and the Jesuits? Yes. It didn't uh, Samuel Morse warn against mm -hmm. this power? Didn't many prelates and preachers warn against this power? Yeah. Why have we forgotten? It seems we need to be reminded exactly. over and over again. So we have discussed now some of the quotes out of Grattan Guinness, and we looked at the issue in the Bible yeah. through Grattan Guinness's we've writings. And now we've also looked at what Benedict, what's what he is current saying. and so on. And let's look at the spirit of prophecy, which is in absolute harmony what Protestantism used to believe. So we're not quoting a, a source that is out of harmony with the Bible here. 
The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ would not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. By the way, Grattan Guinness has a section of this verse mm -hmm. in this book in which he clearly states that the temple of God is the church. And then he quotes Paul where he says to the Corinthians and to the Ephesians, you are the church. temple of the living God. And then he says, the man of sin sits in the Christian church. Yes. Today not in a literal temple in and Jerusalem. And he says it like that, yes. yes. He says, not in a temple of stone. So there is this marvelous synchronism between what the reformers wrote and what, and what, the, what we read here in the writings of Ellen G. White. It's exactly the same. And furthermore, the apostle warns his brethren that the mystery of iniquity does already work, 2 Thessalonians 2, yeah. 3, 4, and 7. Even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors, errors that would prepare the way for the development of the papacy. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. The way in which these books are written is just amazing to me. And when you read those old reformers and you, you put them next to each other, the spirit is identical. There was a man that was preaching on another place, continent or country, at the same time as Luther. And these, the people were asking him and telling him, you sound just like Luther. And he said, I don't know Luther. But if he's preaching the same as I, it must be the spirit that's leading. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. So the church was pure in the beginning mm -hmm. and kept pure because you weren't going to join an organization that was going to be persecuted, right? Yeah. Unless you had a very profound reason. But as persecution ceased and Christianity entered into the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. This is the issue. Mm. So when Donald Trump said that we cannot tolerate anti-Catholic rhetoric, then he has the mindset of today where the history has been wiped out. Yeah. He must study history mm -hmm. and go back to the source and listen to what the early reformers said and to what the early presidents like Lincoln had to say. I mean, there's a book written on this issue by a Catholic priest who became a Protestant, Father Chenicke. Mm. And the book is 50 Years in the Church of Rome where he talks about the assassination of Lincoln and how the Jesuits were the ones that were behind it. People should read books like that. Yes. 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Father Chenicky. Get all of those books and yes. read them. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's a very, very heavy it, book it to has, read. You, you'll probably, like I did, you, you'll read the first three chapters and then you want to cry and put it down for a while. Yes, absolutely. Because the people don't understand why, and I think a lot of people don't understand, why we continually want to make prominent why the Roman Church Yes, is they, they're constantly uh, saying I'm anti-Catholic. Yes. I'm anti-Catholic doctrine. Yes. 
because it is an antichrist doctrine and, and people need to be warned it's never changed never changed never never the nominal conversion of constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing and the world arrayed in robes of righteousness walked into the church now the work of corruption rapidly progressed Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church, her doctrines, ceremonies and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. This was later recorded as tradition. Mm. And in Roman Catholic thinking, tradition is the context in which the Bible must be yes. interpreted. No. Tradition must be tested by the scripture and not the other yes. way around. This is Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. Uh, this is basically the great controversy in its early form. I prefer reading the old ones because they still call a spade a spade. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his effort to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. And when the world gave its power unto this papal system, paganism had rule over the church. And the Pontifex Maximus was nothing other than the old pagan god king yeah. and still is today. It is one of the leading doctrines of Romanism that the Pope is the visible head of the universal church. We just saw mm. that Benedict made it very clear that that was the case. Invested with supreme authority over bishops and pastors in all the world. He even went so far, Malachi Martin said, all other Christian denominations and all other religions. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> that it puts them as the sole entity. Yes. And Benedict finished. Benedict also said other churches are no sisters of ours. Oh. They're not sister churches. No. They are children. Children. Uh -huh. And the Bible clearly says that the great apostate system says, I will not suffer loss of children. They shall return unto me. And what Donald Trump said in his speech is a fulfillment of prophecy. I wish the world would see it. No, it's interesting. You've had all the persecutions in the Middle Ages that the church forced you to be part of her. And then it changed that now they're willingly going back. Absolutely. This is, this is the power of the ecumenical movement. And the main reason is because they forgot history. Yes. And because they're setting aside doctrine. Correct. And Pope Francis clearly said, set aside doctrine. Otherwise we can't have unity. Yes. Doctrine's not important. But the Bible says, take heed of the doctrine. Take heed of the doctrine. So, in other words, when he takes this title, he assumes infallibility. Thus, the same claim urged by Satan in the wilderness of temptation is urged still by him through the Church of Rome, and vast numbers are ready to yield him homage. When you accept this power, you are yielding homage to Satan. Because you bypass Jesus Christ. That's a very serious It's um, a very serious issue. issue. God has never given a hint in his word that he has appointed any man to be the head of the church. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. And so Rome went about to 
change the scriptures. When they couldn't suppress it, when the death sentence no longer worked, because their power was taken away after they received a mortal wound in 1798, they choose, chose another route. Yes, a more... They talk about the Bible. They have so many versions that you don't know what to read. Read that which comes from the received text and you will be reading the Word of God. Amen. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the Scripture. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed. So the people were forbidden to read it or to have it in their houses and thus the Pope came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vice regent of God on earth, endowed with supreme authority over church and state. Yeah, those days people weren't allowed or didn't read their Bibles at all. The uh, church, uh, the priests gave them the word. Yes, because it was only in, in, in the Latin. foreign languages. Only oh, the in, Latin Bible yes. was available to them. The Greek manuscripts were in the Church of the East and not available to them. The detector of error having been removed, that's the Bible, Satan worked according to his will. Prophecy had declared that the papacy was to think chine, times and laws. Now, this is how they worked. This work, it was not slow to attempt. To afford converts from heathenism a substitute for the worship of idols and thus to promote their nominal acceptance of Christianity, the adoration of images and relics were gradually introduced into the Christian worship. But then, of course, the second commandment was in their way, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to read it all but they had to expunge the second commandment from the exactly. law of God. So they took it out, but now they only had nine. So they split the second, the tenth one into two yeah. so that they could have ten. And uh, that, I that surprised me when I, when I discovered these things in the Bible. With what right did they no. take a commandment out of the Bible? With what right? Like we've read in the previous statements, the church believe it's got the power above the Bible. Yes, I can just change it. Mm -hmm. Just go and change it. So the spirit of concession to paganism opened the way for a still further disregard of heaven's authority. Satan tampered with the fourth commandment also. And essayed to set aside the ancient Sabbath, the day which God had blessed and sanctified. I know we've spoken about this a lot, but if people would just look at the Word of God, did the early Christian church keep the Sabbath? Yes. They rested according to the commandment. commandment. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Yes. Yes. Did Paul keep the Sabbath? Yes. History tells us that the early Christian church kept the Sabbath. The Sabbath was preached in many places. It was kept in England. It was only after the year, after the, the year 600 and something that Roman people came to England and found certain people keeping the Sabbath, and they warred against it. Yeah. The Celtic church kept the Sabbath. The Valdensians kept the Sabbath. The Valdenses kept the Sabbath. It's amazing. Africans kept the Sabbath and the missionaries Absolutely. that came here changed yes. them to keep not to keep the Sabbath. When the Jesuits came to India with the Vasco da Gama, they found the Thomasite Christians keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day which the Christians kept. China kept the Sabbath. So it was all places in China. So this change was not at first attempted openly. In the first centuries, the true Sabbath had been kept by all Christians. That the intention of the people might be called to the Sunday, it was made a festival in honor of the resurrection of Christ. With what authority? The church's authority. The authority of the church. 
But the honor shown this day was not yet sufficient to prevent Christians from regarding the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord. Another step must be taken. The false Sabbath must be exalted to an equality with the true. A few years after the issue of Constantine's decree, and by the way, he was still a pagan mm. when he made the decree for Sunday worship. And his coin had Mitra on the one side and Christian symbols on the other side, right? Yeah. The Bishop of Rome conferred on Sunday the title, The Lord's Day. With what authority? Again, the churches. The churches. Thus the people were gradually led to regard it as possessing a degree of sacredness. Still the original Sabbath was kept. Mm. The arts deceiver had not completed his work. He was resolved to gather the Christian world under his banner and to exercise his power through his vice-regent, the proud pontiff, who claimed to be a representative of Christ. Through half-converted pagans, ambitious prelates, and world-loving churchmen, he accomplished his purpose. So they held vast councils, and eventually they pushed it further mm -hmm. and further and further. And thus the pagan festival came finally to be honored as a divine institution, while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be accursed. The great apostate had ex succeeded in exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Just think of it. Infant baptism. Mm. Then the change of the Sabbath. He changed God's laws. Images were back in the church. Relics were being venerated. People that were dead were exalted to the position of sainthood yes. as mediators for humanity. The whole, the whole issue of salvation was changed. And people think because they mention the name of Christ yeah. that they are a Christian power. It's actually, if you really go through, especially Total Onslaught and so on, you see that the it's just it's a pagan religion. Absolutely. It's just the names that's changed. Even the gods that were pagan just got a name change Absolutely. and now became Christian. And they kept the same days. They kept the same days. And they changed the calendar to bring it in harmony with the pagan feast days changed times and Thank laws. You. So the great apostate has succeeded in exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worship. He had dared to change the only precept of the divine law that unmistakably points all mankind to the true and living God. Isn't it interesting that Rome says that the Adventists are the only body of Christian that can find no evidence in this word of God yeah. that uh, they should keep the Sunday. And in fact, they say they are the only consistent Protestants. Yeah. Now, I'm sad to say that many, even in our own ranks, are losing the plot. They cannot see that Rome has not, not changed. changed. And even when you show it, the ecumenical movement has had such an impact on humanity because we have to do it for the common good. Yes. The scary thing is, there's so many things that's pulling the people away from the true focus that you have to have to see that the Antichrist system is still going to rule this whole thing. Yes, and... That means Jesus Christ is sidelined. My salvation does not lie in social doctrine. No. That is something for this world and for this kingdom. And this kingdom is coming to an end. So to put my energy into a social doctrine, I'm not against no. fairness for all people. Absolutely. Nothing to do with it. But that's not where my salvation lies. My salvation lies in my faith in Jesus Christ. And my faith in Jesus Christ and his saving grace for all humanity makes all who accept his promise and his salvation my brothers and my yeah. sisters.
And, and that's what makes us brothers and sisters. Yes. Not we've got a common cause. No. Because, because that common cause can change from area to area. Yes, and that's what's happening now. The common Absolutely. cause, like we've seen with that um, whole ecumenical gather gathering, the return. The common causes we have to get God back into the country. So it doesn't matter what, how, in what way we do but it. But for what purpose must He come back into the country so that you can set up an earthly kingdom? Kingdom, which is not what which God is going to be destroyed. Yes, with, uh, that's why you have to understand the image of Daniel. Absolutely. All right, let's continue. So eventually, Rome took the papal seat and ruled supreme for 1,260 years, mm. from 538 AD to 1798. And then were fulfilled the words of Jesus, you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death, and you shall be hated for, by all men for my name's sake. Persecution upon the faithful with greater fury than ever before, and the world became a vast battlefield. This is what happened. And then the woman fled into the wilderness, the church, mm -hmm. the true church of God, fled away. The Valdenses, they fled away and worshipped God according to their conscience and according to the word of God. The advancing centuries witnessed the constant increase of error in the doctrines put forth from Rome. So it didn't stop. It was not just an instant thing. No. It was a progression. Even before the establishment of the papacy, the teachings of heathen philosophers had received attention and exerted an influence in the church. Today, what the Roman church believes in is Greek philosophy. Mm. The whole system of natural law is based on Greek philosophy. In fact, it's interesting that in Revelation chapter 13, the body of the structure is given a Greek body. Yes, it was a leopard body. So Greek philosophy is the basis of Roman Catholicism. It's not the gospel, it's paganism. Yeah. And, the heart. and now we can see it clearly in the encyclical. Absolutely. One of the doctrines, of course, which is very important is natural immortality and consciousness in death. This doctrine laid the foundation upon which Rome established the invocation of saints and the adoration of the Virgin Mary. Isn't that interesting? That Donald Trump went and knelt in that shrine in front of this huge relief of John Paul II. That's a dead man mm -hmm. who knows nothing, who has nothing to do on this earth anymore and he's sleeping in the grave until Judgment Day, right? Yep. And he received from a Catholic priest, a statue of Mary to place into the White House. Yeah. That is idolatry. Mm -hmm. That is something forbidden in the Word of God. That is part of the commandment that Rome expunged from the Ten mm -hmm. Commandments. And they don't see it. Is it not our duty to warn the world that a false system of worship has set itself up as an authority? Mm -hmm and will introduce its form of government and enforce it upon the world? Yes, and it's also our duty to warn people, don't be blinded by what perceives to be Christian. Exactly. It looks good, and we, and we so, I mean the conservative Christian people, so want to get rid of all this secularism and all this, that they want to go with this, but this is n not a Christian institution and Christian teachings. Our Catholic friends that don't know these things, we are not allowed to, according to papal theology today, to tell them these things, because that's proselytizing. Mm. And we're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to leave everyone where he is. In the latest encyclical that the Pope just wrote, 
on brotherly fraternity. He clearly mentions the Muslim world, he mentions the Jewish world, he mentions the various thinkers of the world, he even mentions the bishops in South Africa and says we must all these religions and all these people and all these migrants and everybody with different ideas tolerate each other and live together and basically leave them where they are. That is religious liberty. But to preach to them and to try to convert them is something that you should not do. But the Bible clearly yeah. says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Yeah. That means that every Roman Catholic should be confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he can make an informed choice. Mm. Now, in my own case, if I had not been confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, I would have still been where I was. And I would not have known the beauty of the plan of salvation. I would not have understood what is happening in the world. The word of God is the basis upon which we must make our decisions. And there are many other issues that we could talk on. The issue of indulgences, the issue of purgatory. Uh, we've discussed these things before in What's Up Prof. We don't have to do that. These are not Christian doctrines. These are pagan doctrines. Mm. These are Greek philosophies. What are they doing in the Christian world? How can two sit together lest they agreed? How can a Protestant Christian say that he accepts Roman Catholicism as a Christian form of worship on the basis of them using the name Jesus Christ? And even talking about Jesus Christ as divinity, but working through the priest, working through the saints, working Mary. through Mary and bypassing Jesus Christ and making the church the bridge builder, these doctrines are a travesty of judge justice when it comes to the word of God. Mm. And then the selling of indulgences by such means did Rome fill her coffers and sustain the magnificent luxury and vice of the pretended representatives of him who had not where to lay his head not to speak of the millions that were sacrificed yeah. in this war of faith. So I want to just tell the presidents of the world and the people of the world that we need to study the Bible and need to study what the reformers believed. We need to take the dust of books such as this that still clearly spoke about what the word had to say. So here's the question. In this age of ecumenism, where you're not supposed to say anything derogatory about any other mm -hmm. religion. The, uh, the modern phrase is, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Are we not supposed to preach the word of God? Are we not to lead people to the fountain of living water? So what does this church stand for? And even in our rank, own ranks, there are many voices which say we should, mm -hmm. <laughs> we should lower the rhetoric. We shouldn't say any of these things. But let's read some of the statements in the spirit of prophecy. Called to expose the man of sin. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and laws and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him by keeping the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation, as holy unto the Lord. It's our duty to speak about these things. And it's not only the spirit of prophecy that says so. 
The Bible says yes. so. And the Bible says you will be persecuted when you do it. That you will be persecuted. And the Bible also says if you don't do it. Then the blood, the blood is on your head. head. We are to give the people the warning contained in Revelation. The truth in regard to the Sabbath of the Lord is to proclaim. It's not just the Sabbath that's important. Mm. It's what is built into the yes, Sabbath. The, the worship of the true God. It's the sign that you accept Him as your authority and not some earthly imposter. The Bible says that the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. Mm -hmm. now we've listened to these speeches now. This is what we're talking about. And why is it such a serious matter? Well, here's an interesting statement. It comes from letters and manuscripts, and it says, The power which has the deepest inward corruption will make the greatest display and will clothe itself with the most elaborate signs of power. The Bible plainly declares that this covers a corrupt and deceiving wickedness. Upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. That's pretty harsh language. Mm -hmm. What is it that gives its kingdom this power? Protestantism. A power which, while professing to have the temper and spirit of a lamb, and to be allied to heaven speaks with the voice of a dragon. It is moved by a power from beneath. Protestantism will give the power back to the beast. Yeah. It had separated itself. It'll give it back. And look at what's happening. And we can see it in the speeches. The Roman church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. We cannot call it a Christian power. No. The uh, Pope Francis, in quite recently and in a few times already, apologized made apologies. Even to the Valdenses? Yes. Is it a, a deep-rooted apology? No. According to this, definitely no, not. Definitely not. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes. We can see this. Mm -hmm. And claimed the prerogative of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be. The apostasy of the latter times. It is part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as part of the Church of Christ? It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the Reformers. What did we read in the beginning? Yep. Dangerously latitudinarian. Yes. Dangerously. Yes. And we will have to redo the Reformation. We will have to fight this battle all over again. This is exactly where we are. The church that holds the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. 
Protestants were once thus apart from the great church of apostasy, but they have approached much more near to her and are still in the path of reconciliation to the church of Rome. Rome never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. She has not lessened the breach between herself and Protestants. They have done all the advancing. But what does this argue for the Protestantism of this day? It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Yes. These are strong words, but it is the truth. I think we have made our point. We don't have to continue along this vein. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. And I think it's also pretty clear what the sentiments of the two candidates for president at exactly. this stage is. So we are living in a time of prophetic fulfillment. And this is a warning to the world. And we want to end with a very uplifting statement. It comes from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 136. And it reads, when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmest the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. I think it has become clear mm. that the nation is on the side of the great rebel leader. May God give his people wisdom and may we wake up to warn humanity for what is about to transpire. Never before in the history of the United States have speeches such as we discuss today been made from the highest office of the United States of America by both candidates in the presidential run. May God help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, prophecy is fulfilling before our eyes and a world needs to be warned. Help us to be awake and alert for the times that are coming and to warn those who are in the valley of decision. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.